God bless you. Good morning, everyone. So glad that you came to worship with us today. The Lord is with us today. I want to tell you that he is present here to meet each need that is in this room, to meet us in a special way. I want you to open your heart to his presence this morning. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and I want to share with you about the beauty of of spiritual language. We've been working our way through the book of 1 Corinthians. We started last September, and uh, we're almost at the end of the road. We're going to finish with the great passage uh, about the resurrection on Easter Sunday morning. But we've been talking about spiritual gifts, and we're going to talk about the beauty of spiritual language. While you find your way to 1 Corinthians 14, uh, just very quickly, annual report is coming up on Wednesday evening, March 18th. We hope that you'll join us especially if you're a member of Harvest Time Church. We hope that you'll make it a point to be with us once a year. Our Board of Deacons and Trustees brings a report of our finances, everything that was given to our church last year, how it was invested for the kingdom of God, and our pastors are bringing reports. We'll be selecting two new deacons for our Board of Deacons and Trustees. And so uh, if you're a member of Harvest Time, we'd especially love you to be here. If you're part of our family, if you worship with us on a regular basis, but you're not yet a member, we would love to have you attend, and we will have programs for the teenagers and for the children downstairs. Um, I want to remind you about Good Friday worship celebration. We're going to fill up the Palace Theater on Good Friday evening in Stamford, and we're going to be preaching about the cross. And so I want you to be in prayer that it's going to be a great night of harvest. Um, I want you to pray about who needs to come with you, a friend, a coworker, a family member, neighbor, uh, begin praying now that when you invite them to come and be with us on Good Friday evening, that they're going to say yes and that the Lord is going to open their heart to receive the good news about Jesus. And then Easter Sunday morning, uh, we're going to have one worship service on Easter Sunday morning. We're going down the street to SUNY Purchase, just a couple miles down the road, about two, three miles down the road. We've rented the large auditorium at SUNY Purchase. It holds 1,400 people, and there's a great children's ministry area. And we're going to have just one worship service because we're losing our front door this week. And uh, we don't feel like on Easter Sunday we can just uh, have all the cars and all the people. We don't think we can pull it off. And so we hope you'll join us on Easter Sunday. Thanks for your prayers on behalf of Phase 2. We did lose a little bit of time this week because of the weather. But on Friday afternoon, the fire marshal came and did a final inspection and cleared us to close the front door and begin excavating uh, in front of the front door, which was the final place that we need to dig out. And um, we're looking like we're going to be ready just in time for the weather to warm up and start pouring concrete. So thank you for your prayers. Thank you for all of your giving, and thank you for your patience as we uh, move forward with constructions. All right, 1 Corinthians 14, beginning in verse 1. Paul says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire the gifts of the Holy Spirit, especially prophecy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries by the Spirit. But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. Anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church might be edified. Skip the next couple of verses. Jump down to verse 13, if you would. 1 Corinthians 14, beginning in verse 13. For this reason, the one who speaks in a tongue should pray that they may interpret what they say. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit and I will also pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, and I will also sing with my understanding. Otherwise, when you're praising God in the spirit, how can someone else who is in the position of an inquirer say amen to your thanksgiving since they don't know what you're saying? You're giving thanks well enough, but no one is edified. Look at verse 18. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Now, jumping down to the very end of this chapter, verse 39, let's look at the last words. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but everything should be done in a fitting 
and an orderly way. Let's pray and just invite the Holy Spirit to minister to us. Father, thanks for this morning. Thank you for the people you love so much. Father, have your way. I thank you that you have a gift of grace for each person in this room, Lord. Father, where our hearts are open to receive everything you have for us. If you agree with that, just say amen and amen in Jesus' name. I want to spend a few minutes talking to you about the gift of spiritual language, the gift of tongues. Although I speak rather often about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, in 25 years of ministry, I think this is the first time that I have ever devoted an entire sermon to explore the significance and the purpose of tongues. I have two goals for our time this morning. First, I pray that every one of us would leave this place with a deeper appreciation for the beauty of spiritual language. And second, I pray that every one of us would leave prepared for a deeper experience with spiritual language. At the end of our time together, we're going to invite you to come forward to the altar if you'd like to receive prayer. And I want to tell you, we have just had a powerful morning all morning in the presence of the Lord here at the altar. But I want you to listen with an open heart. I want you to listen with a teachable spirit. I want you to listen with a peaceable mind as we talk about what is spiritual language. I have nine things that I want to share with you now. I see your eyes. Don't panic. We've made it through all the other services. We'll make it through this one. I'm going to give you nine quick hits, all right? Do you have faith? Do you believe? All right. Did you eat something before you came? I hope so. Let's talk about what is spiritual language. First of all, spiritual language is a good gift that is available to every believer in Jesus Christ. I want to ask you to do something this morning. Whatever your belief about spiritual language, whatever your feelings, whatever your past experiences, be they good, bad, or ugly, I want to ask you to set those aside for a moment and consider these truths from Scripture. First of all, consider that spiritual language originated in the New Testament with the ministry of Jesus. He was the first one to talk about tongues. Before he ascended to heaven, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the good news. And these signs shall accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will lay hands on the sick and the sick will recover. He told the disciples, I'm going to send you the gift my father has promised you. Stay in Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high. In a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Second, consider that the church began speaking in tongues on the very same day that the church began. Tongues must be an important gift or God wouldn't have bestowed it on such an important occasion as the birthday of the church. The Father wouldn't have allowed anything unworthy or unbecoming or unloving to happen on the birthday of His church. Third, consider that everyone present on the day of Pentecost spoke in tongues. At the church's birth, spiritual language was the birthright of every believer. No one was left out from the experience of tongues. It was not for some believers. It was for all. Fourth, consider Peter's words on the day of Pentecost reiterating the Father's promise to all future generations. When the crowds in Jerusalem heard the believers come down out of the upper room speaking in tongues, they said, what does this sign mean? Peter stood up and he delivered an extended prophetic utterance that ended with a reiteration of the Father's promise that was first announced by Jesus. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and for your children, and for all generations far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. The spiritual language which the onlookers marveled at and inquired about is part and parcel of this perpetual promise 
to all. Fifth, consider Paul's personal enthusiasm for tongues and his commendation of tongues to every believer. 1 Corinthians 14 is a little bit of a tricky chapter. Actually, we've been through this letter chapter by chapter, and I found all of them to be tricky chapters, and this one is no different. Paul is trying to correct a bad situation in Corinth. It appears that the Corinthians had come to view tongues as the pinnacle of spiritual maturity and spiritual experience. To the point that when they gathered together for worship, some of them wanted to do nothing but speak in tongues the entire time. And Paul is writing to correct that situation. In chapter 12, he wrote to us that there are many spiritual gifts in addition to tongues through which God blesses his body. Last week, we talked about nine of those gifts, but there are even more than nine. In chapter 13, he writes that the real pinnacle of Christian maturity is love, which always has as its aim to build others up. Which is why in chapter 14, he writes that the intelligible gifts are much better than tongues in public worship services because they build others up. But listen, it's extremely important that we not throw the baby out with the bathwater. In the midst of correction, it's important not to overlook all the affirming things that Paul says about tongues. Verse 18, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Verse 5, I would like every one of you to speak in tongues. Verse 39, do not forbid speaking in tongues. Spiritual language was important to Paul's personal spiritual life and he commends it to every believer. If you have any negative beliefs or any negative feelings about tongues, I want to ask you to set those aside and consider without prejudice what the scripture really says. Spiritual language is God's idea. The Father intended it. Jesus prophesied it. The Holy Spirit enabled it and the church received it. And it is perfectly right for us to desire today what every believer was given at the beginning. What is spiritual language? Second, it is just what it says. Actual languages. Beloved, tongues is not gibberish. Tongues is not emotionalism run amok. Tongues is not irrational. Rather, it is supernatural. Speakers in tongues are not incoherent when they speak. Listen to what Paul says about tongues. He says in verse 15 that those who speak in tongues choose to speak. They are in control of their speech at all times. In verse 2, he says that the person being addressed is known. It is God. In verse 5, he says the content of what is being spoken sometimes becomes known after the fact. In verse 10, Paul says something interesting. He says, undoubtedly, there are all sorts of languages in the world, and none of them is without meaning. People who study language estimate that there have been 20,000 languages and dialects in the history of the world. They believe about 15,000 of them are now extinct So that leaves about 5,000 languages and dialects that exist in the world today, and there is not a single linguist who knows even a hundred of those. So who can say that speakers in tongues are not speaking a language that either exists in the present or has existed in the past? Furthermore, Paul calls spiritual languages the tongues of angels. And it could very well be that some of the tongues that we speak are known in heaven and not at all on earth. On the day of Pentecost, there were 120 people speaking in tongues, and yet less than 20 languages were identified by the onlookers. So what were all the others speaking? They were speaking tongues of men and tongues of angels. And therein lies the evidence that tongues are not gibberish, 
but actual languages. There have been many instances in the church, even right here at harvest time, where although the language was not known by the speaker, it was known by someone else in the service. There have also been incidents where there was a message in tongues given and an interpretation given, and neither the person speaking in tongues nor the interpreter knew the language, but there was a third party in the room who did know the language that was spoken and confirmed that everything that was given in the interpretation was accurate. Undoubtedly, there are all sorts of languages in the world, and none of them is without meaning. What is spiritual language? Number three. See, you're all worried when I said nine. We're, we're a third of the way through already. We're, we're booking. We're, we're making tracks. Spiritual language is a vehicle for worship that surpasses the boundaries of my known language or languages. Some of you know the great Methodist hymn writer, Charles Wesley. On the first anniversary of being born again, Charles Wesley wrote, I think, what are his most famous lyrics. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. Charles Wesley was on his deathbed with pneumonia. And there was a group of Moravians that was tending to him, nursing him. And in the course of his interaction with these Moravians, believers in Jesus, Charles Wesley came to a living, dynamic faith in Christ. The Lord healed him. And along the way, one of his Moravian caretakers made an off-the-cuff remark to Charles Wesley. He said, if I had a thousand languages, I would use every one of them to praise him. And after he was healed, Charles Wesley wrote those words, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. I wonder if you have ever felt like that. I wonder if you have ever had a moment where there is so much gratitude in your heart toward God, where there is so much love in your heart, where there is so much joy in your heart that you just don't have words enough to express it. When you think about what Jesus has done for you, when you think about how he saved you, when you think about how he healed you, when you think about how he set you free, when you think about how he's changed your whole life, when you think about how he rescued you from the brink of destruction, it makes you want to shout. It makes you want to bust a move. It makes you want to slap your mama. It makes you want to laugh. It makes you want to cry all at the same time. I want to tell you that that is precisely the time for spiritual language. It is a vehicle for worship when my words just aren't enough. Tongues is a multi-purpose resource. And Paul says one of those purposes is praise. I like this. In verses 16 and 17, Paul says that tongues is praising God with beautiful thanksgiving. He says, when you're worshiping in tongues, you give thanks well. The word there is kalos. The word is beautiful. You give thanks beautifully, Paul says. Paul says in verses 7 and 8 that this is praise which arises from my innermost being, from my spirit, from the deepest place inside of me. He said we're like a flute or a trumpet and the wind of God blows through us and it creates a heavenly sound. He says we're like a harp and the fingers of God move across the fibers of our innermost being and it produces excellent praise to God. Jesus said that now is the time that the Father is looking for worshipers like this, those who worship him in spirit and in truth. On the day of Pentecost, the onlookers heard the tongue speakers making exclamations of high praise. They said, we hear them declaring the excellent greatness of God. In verse 15, Paul says that he sings in his spiritual language as well as speaks in it. Singing in the Spirit was a vital part of Paul's devotional life. And it was also a vital part of the church's worship. 
When the Holy Spirit came on Pentecost, most of them praised God in tongues that were not interpreted. When the Spirit came on those that were gathered at Cornelius' house, they praised God in tongues that were not interpreted. When the Spirit came on the believers in Ephesus, they praised God in tongues that were not interpreted. Beloved, listen, that cannot be out of order because the Holy Spirit is never the author of disorder. Later on, Paul told the Colossians and the Ephesians, sing to one another in the Spirit. In our worship services, there are interludes. When we do sing in the Spirit and pray in the Spirit, each one of us lifting up our heart to God. Our services are punctuated by that, just like they were in the New Testament, but they're not dominated by that. We sing in the Spirit and we sing together in our common language. We pray in the Spirit and then we pray together in our common language. We receive teaching in English. We receive prophetic words that are intelligible. It is the right balance of both. What is spiritual language? Number four, it is a vehicle for prayer that surpasses the limitations of my thoughts and emotions. Another purpose of prayer, of tongues, is prayer. And during this prayer, my spirit makes a very direct connection with the Father. Paul says in verse 2, anyone who speaks in an unknown tongue speaks directly to God. He said in verse 14, if I pray with my spirit, my mind is passive. Paul wrote to the Romans that there are times when we desperately need the Holy Spirit's help in prayer. There are times when we are just too weak to pray. There are times when our emotions are just too played out. There are times when our faith is worn down. Sometimes we have negative thoughts. Sometimes our own human reasoning in a situation limits us from believing that nothing is impossible with God. There are times when we just don't know how to pray about a situation. We can't discern what is God's will in the matter. And that's precisely the time for prayer in our spiritual language. In a way that exceeds my ability to really explain to you, the Holy Spirit comes and He partners with our human spirit and He enables us to pray in agreement with God's will. And He does that through the vehicle of spiritual language. You know, sometimes when we're trying to communicate with people, it just feels like we're struggling to connect. Sometimes when we're trying to to communicate with our spouse, we just have a hard time connecting with a friend, with a coworker, with a client. You know, we're just we're just missing each other. What you're trying to say is not coming out. It's it's being misunderstood. The feedback that you're getting uh, is uh, not what you're looking for. We're just missing each other. And sometimes prayer feels like that too. Sometimes we feel like we're not connecting with the Father in prayer. There used to be an old saying, it feels like the heavens are brass. It feels like our prayers are not penetrating. It feels like they're not reaching the Father's ear. Can I tell you, in those moments, praying in the Spirit is a surefire way to connect directly with God every time. And praying in the Spirit helps prayer to stay fresh and alive and not become a dead ritual to us. What is spiritual language? Number five. Look at that. We're halfway through. More uh, more already. Isn't it amazing? What is spiritual language? Number five. It is a mighty weapon of spiritual warfare. Another purpose of tongues is to enable us to withstand the enemy's attacks and to triumph over him. In 2 Corinthians, Paul says that we have been equipped with spiritual weapons that have divine power to demolish demonic strongholds and destroy demonic strategies that are set against us. In Ephesians, Paul identifies one of those weapons as praying in the Spirit. He says, be strong in the Lord's mighty power. Put on the whole armor of God and continuously pray in the Spirit. 
in a way that I can't really explain to you. The Holy Spirit comes and He partners with our human spirit and He confronts our enemy. He confronts the devil and his demons. He enables us to take authority over them and to destroy their evil works. Beloved, listen to me. If the enemy is trying to get a member of your family, if he's trying to steal away a member of your family, if he's trying to uh, creep into the atmosphere of your home, use the powerful weapon of warfare that God has given you in spiritual language. I want to tell you what. Go through your house praying in tongues, worshiping in tongues. The enemy does not have authority in your house. You have authority in your house use your weapons what is spiritual language number six it is a spiritual discipline that makes me stronger in my subconscious being if you've received a gift let me take a poll how many of you have a gift I'm not trying to embarrass anybody but how many of you received a spiritual language let me see if you've received wow Awesome, a little uh, over, they're all backsliders in the 10 o'clock service. It was less than half, so uh, there's more now after we finished praying. If you have received a spiritual language, don't tell the 10 o'clock service I said that, so we love them. Jesus loves 10 o'clock. You know, they're just, they're coming along. They're, they'll get there. If you've received a spiritual language, you need to worship and pray in that every day. Every day. I'll tell you how you do it. Uh, just put on a little worship music in your car, at home, uh, when you have some time to yourself, and just begin to worship along. Get some, get some anointed. You know, I like the songs on K-Love. I really do. But, you know, there's deeper worship than that. There's worship that, that really brings us into another realm of the Spirit. Get, get yourself some of that. Uh, Pastor Nick, help you. Pastor Jason, Elizabeth, they'll help you get hooked up with some worship that takes you to that place. But fill your spirit with worship, and then begin worshiping worshiping in your spiritual language and then begin praying in your spiritual language you need to make it a daily discipline my old bible school president he used to quote paul he used to say to us i thank god i speak in tongues more than all of you and you know what he did I used to watch him out my window of my dorm room crossing our campus. And every time I saw him, his lips were moving, just quietly worshiping the Lord and praying in his spiritual language. And because he did, he was always ready to respond to what the Holy Spirit wanted to do in any given moment. Jesus said, I only do what I see my father doing. I only say what I hear my father saying. It was because he was completely immersed in the spirit that he he was ready at every moment and he had the faith to act on what the spirit said because he had sown to the spirit so I want to tell you this is a gift that if you have it you need to exercise it it's like a muscle the more you work it out the bigger it'll grow the stronger it'll get the more it'll move for you Paul says that the result of spiritual language is that our inner man is edified our inner man is built up it is strengthened do you know that our emotions come from a subconscious level of our being? You know, sometimes in spite of what we know to be true, sometimes in spite of the facts that we have in our minds, we have feelings that arise that overtake us and overpower us. They come from a level of being deeper than our thoughts. I remember when our twins were born. They're 13 now, but when they were born, they were premature. They were several weeks early. They were just four pounds each. They were so tiny. We, we couldn't even buy anything small enough to fit them. And right after they were born, we had to take them uh, to the pediatrician, and there's a certain blood test they do where they draw blood out of the heel. Um, some of you parents will know that. And so there were our little teeny weeny premature babies. And because they were so tiny, the nurse was having a terrible time getting the blood out of their heel. They were just too little. And so she was very sweet, but she just kept sticking them again and again and again. And the, the babies were screaming. They were crying. And I have to tell you, in my head... I knew that this was necessary 
In my head, I knew that what was happening was beneficial. It was for their health. I, I knew it had to be done. The nurse was very sweet. Uh, she was apologetic. In my head, I knew that. But I want to tell you, something rose up inside of me for the first time. A father lion showed up, and I wanted to rip her head off. <laughs> I, I wanted to full body tackle her and rescue my babies out of, I was so angry. It, it was an unreasonable, irrational anger that came from another part of my being. I was so mad when she was finished. I grabbed our coats and I said to Denise, we're leaving. Let's get out of here right now. <laughs> our feelings come from a level of being that's deeper than our, our mind, our will comes from a level of being that is deeper than our mind. The affections and the appetites of our heart, even the words of our mouth. Jesus said, out of the contents of the heart, the mouth speaks. Sometimes, even though your brain knows better, you cannot stop those words from flying out your mouth. It is this level of subconscious being that the Holy Spirit ministers to while we are worshiping and praying in our spiritual language. Listen, while you're worshiping God in tongues, while you're praying in tongues, your emotions are stabilized and they are balanced. I don't want you to take this the wrong way, but I have to say it. You don't need more medication. You need more Holy Spirit. I'm not against medication. I'm thankful that it's there. But I want to tell you, I believe that God would have us to be on much less medication that when, than what we're on. There is a remedy. There is an answer in the prayer closet as we minister to the Lord in our spiritual language. Our emotions come into check. They become balanced. They become stabilized. So we're not a mess all over the place. Our will is strengthened. Our resolve to do God's will is forged as we pray and we worship in tongues. Listen, if you're battling an addiction, I want to tell you the most powerful thing that you can do is to use your prayer language for worship and for prayer. Our fleshly affections and appetites are subdued as we worship and pray in tongues. Paul said to the Galatians, if you live by the Spirit... You will not gratify the sinful desires of your, of your flesh. And worshiping and praying in the Spirit is sowing to please the Spirit. And we reap a harvest of life. Paul talks about this in Ephesians 3 when he says, I pray that he will strengthen you in your innermost being with the power of the Holy Spirit. It's interesting that Jesus talked about our initial experience of salvation as a well. And he talked about our ongoing experience with the Spirit as rivers. Beloved, there is a definitive moment of encounter with Jesus Christ. There is a decisive moment of faith when we're convinced in the deepest place that Jesus is Lord. There's a decisive moment of surrender to him. There's a decisive moment in which we receive his salvation. In John 4, Jesus called it a well of eternal life. But beyond that, there is an ongoing experience with the Holy Spirit. There's an ongoing experience of refreshing. There's an ongoing experience of discovery. There's an ongoing experience of power. On the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, while the Jews were commemorating the rock in the wilderness that was struck and poured out a river, Jesus stood up and he cried in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures say, rivers of living water will flow out of his innermost being. By this he meant the Holy Spirit. 
Beloved, listen to me. Jesus was the pillar of fire in the wilderness that guided the children of Israel. Jesus was the manna that appeared on the desert floor that they ate. And Jesus is the rock that was smitten that has poured out rivers for us in the wilderness. And every time we worship and we pray in the Spirit, rivers are released again and again and again in the wilderness of our human experience. Where rivers flow, there is life and growth and fruit. Where rivers flow, there is refreshing. Where rivers flow, there is forward movement. Where rivers flow, there is a constant change of scenery. Where rivers flow, there is beauty and there is power. I can tell you one thing I know is that Jesus wants to release rivers in this place this morning. He who speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself. What is spiritual language? Number seven. It is a vehicle for receiving revelation from God. Paul says that our mind is in a passive state when we pray in tongues. Interesting, they've actually done studies, scientific studies, where they've put people in MRIs and uh, they have recorded their brain activity as they speak in tongues. And they've actually verified uh, scientifically what Paul says in the scripture about that. But even though our mind is in a passive state, when we speak in tongues, our mind ultimately benefits. Paul says in verse 2 that while we are praying in tongues, our spirit is uttering mysteries. Now to us, a mystery means something hidden, a puzzle, something inscrutable. But when Paul used that word, mystery meant exactly the opposite. A mystery is something disclosed. It is something revealed. It is something that has been discovered. So Paul is saying when we worship and pray in tongues, our spirit is speaking revelations. Our spirit is speaking disclosures. It is speaking spiritual discoveries which then become available to our conscious mind. Maybe I could explain it this way. While we are worshiping and praying in tongues, we receive a download in our spirit from the Holy Spirit. And then what he downloaded into our spirit is uploaded to our mind. You with me on that? You follow that? You're looking at me all confused. Let me say it again. While I'm praying in tongues, the Holy Spirit downloads revelation to me. And what he has put in my spirit then gets uploaded to my mind. And Paul tells us, exactly what it is we receive. He said we receive words of divine guidance. If you don't know what to do, if you have a major decision to make, if you don't know what to do about a situation, I want to encourage you, spend a little time worshiping and praying in tongues, and the Holy Spirit will download words of wisdom to you, word of knowledge, divine information that gives you insight into the root of a problem and the cure, prophecy, that's divine insight into God's future intent and plan, illumination to the meaning of scriptures. All of these things are downloaded to us while we're worshiping and praying in tongues. What is spiritual language? Number eight. We're almost there. Worship team, you can help me. What is spiritual language? Number eight. I want you to listen to this one. It is an experience that requires... The engagement of my will by faith. I borrowed my title from a book by Jack Hayford called The Beauty of Spiritual Language. And I'm indebted to Pastor Jack for some of the things that we've shared this morning. But if you don't know who Jack Hayford is, he's a real father of the Pentecostal charismatic movement. Uh, pastored a great, one of, really one of the first mega churches in the country was 15 or 18,000 people when he was pastoring it. And uh, a great, great father in the Lord. But in this book, he shares very candidly about his own struggle to receive spiritual language. And he shares about a misperception that he had to overcome in order to receive the full expression of this gift. When he was a senior in high school, he was at a church service. 
He had prayer to receive spiritual language. And he said that he got four syllables in his mind. And he held those four syllables in his mind for three years. Finally, when he was a junior in Bible college, he spoke them for the first time. And he said, like so many people, he thought that the Holy Spirit was going to take over his speech organs. That he was going to have some kind of spiritual seizure, linguistic seizure. And that the Holy Spirit was going to take over his lips and his tongue and his vocal cords. He said he didn't realize that spiritual language is a cooperative effort between the Holy Spirit and us. There is a participatory response that is required on our part. There is a voluntary response. In Acts 2 verse 4, it says, They began to speak in tongues as the Holy Spirit enabled them. Paul says here in verse 15, I will speak with my spirit. I will sing with my spirit. In verse 32, he says, The utterances of prophets are subject to the prophets. So when it comes to receiving spiritual language, God doesn't take control of your mouth. You are in control of your mouth. You must will to speak. You must begin to speak. But the contents of what you speak comes from the Holy Spirit through the channel of your human spirit. You know, for some people that is very easy. It's very natural. It's not a problem at all. We had several people last night, 8.30, 10 o'clock. It just came just like that for them. It's the way it came for me. I was an eight-year-old boy alone on my bed. I didn't even know what the baptism of the Holy Spirit was. Uh, somebody had to explain it to me. My mom had to explain it to me the next day what had happened to me. But, you know, I didn't have a lot of inhibitions as an eight-year-old boy. For others of us, there is a hurdle of self-consciousness that we have to cross over. Some people have the same experience that Pastor Jack had. They hear syllables in their head first. And then they have to muster the courage to speak them out. I was praying for someone not too long ago to receive her spiritual language. And I could sense the presence of the Lord all over her while we were praying. But nothing was happening. And so prompted by the Holy Spirit, I just said to her, Do you hear syllables in your head right now? And she said, Yes! And I said, just speak them out. And as soon as she did, the Lord gave a beautiful flow of spiritual language. What is spiritual language? Finally this. It is a sign of supernatural activity to unbelievers that is further enhanced by the gift of prophecy. Paul says in verse 22 that tongues have a real sign value to unbelievers. When they hear tongues, they know that something supernatural is happening. That was certainly the case on the day of Pentecost. The onlookers were amazed and they said, what does this mean? However, in order for that sign value to be retained, intelligible communication must follow. Paul says, if you keep on speaking in tongues, the unbelievers will say, you're out of your minds. So a message with intelligible content must follow and then unbelievers will experience the conviction of the Holy Spirit and open their hearts to Jesus. You know, that's just how it happened on the day of Pentecost. Tongues was a sign of supernatural activity, but the believers kept on speaking in tongues and amazement turned to amusement. The onlookers began to mock them and say, ah, they're just drunk. So the believers stopped speaking in tongues and Peter brought an extended prophetic word that caused the conviction of the Holy Spirit to fall on them. 3,000 people received Christ that day. I'd say that was a pretty good day in church, don't you? And that's precisely my prayer for our worship services. That our worships and prayers in spiritual language would be a sign to unbelievers followed by prophetic ministry that opens their heart to receive Christ. And my prayer for you today is that you would more deeply appreciate the beauty of this spiritual language and that you would more deeply experience the beauty of this spiritual language. I want to invite you to stand this morning and I want to ask you if you would just give a great big praise to Jesus, the King of Kings 
and the Lord of Lords in this place. Come on.